I'm very proud of my connection with the, what was then known as the OTU. It's still alive, but on another aircraft. One of the lessons that came out from 65 was the squadrons were heavily loaded with the conversion training of young pilots. And uh, the training element was so heavy that it was cutting into the operational preparedness. So the decision was taken at some level that we should have an operational training unit and it had to be on hunters. About uh, the mid 60s roughly also, uh, we had heard about the new drop tanks that could be fitted on the hunter, 56, uh, 230 gallon tanks on the inboard in lieu of the hundred again. The negotiations must have taken place because they said we will have to give OTU the old aircraft, which was fair enough. So I was, uh, I had just come back from the States and I was called to air headquarters and they shared this vision with me. And I said, fine. And, um, we had a unit of 24 aircraft, 20 56s and four trainers. And uh, when I arrived on the 1st of October, I was the first person over there. And I, we built this out of six other hunter squadrons, moving ourselves up and down, ferrying the aircraft and all. It took me, I think, about eight to 10 weeks before I could get the aircraft people and like everything else, they post me an engineering officer who'd never seen a hunter in his, before in his life. But it was all great education. Then I was asked what about the syllabus or what we call a training directive. So then Wing Commander A.J. Dotiwala, who was the Air One at command, he said, Cecil, why don't you draft it? So I sat down and drafted my own directive, saying everything that I wanted to, sent it by hand to Western Air Command, and it was sent back to me, duly signed with not a single change. I'm delighted to know that that training directive still holds after so many years, but it was a great challenge. They posted me experienced um, cure fires, most of whom I knew very well. And uh, a year after we started training, the problem in the Kutch started. So we, I must explain, we came under Western Air Command for training, but we came under an organization called Headquarters Western India and in Pune which was headed by then Air Commodore Mulkaunka. And uh, so I really had two bosses. So when we got this alert, we were told stop training, conserve flying hours, and uh, get yourselves operated. There were no uh, proper blast pens at Jamnagar. There were two open blast pens. There was no ORP. They laid a cable 12 kilometers from the signals unit and pitched two tents. And that's where I learned and learned Scrabble. Because we had to sit in those tents whole day and we had all our youngsters doing nothing except ground subjects to that. But then we were cleared to do early morning flying and late night flying from the ORP aircraft, which we did. We were armed, we were allowed right up to the Kutch border and uh, we could virtually see Badin, which was one of the targets that was allocated to us. 
then eventually things died down a bit and uh, we got back to training. And in 1969, I handed over command of OTU, which produced quite a lot of young officers who did very well in 1971. I still have a letter from Pete Wilson, which said, Hey, Nosy, all your hard work paid off in 71. That's the story of OTU. Naturally, because of the war, 20 Squadron was the highlight of my 35 years in the Air Force. One is, I missed the first war, 65, so do remember, 71 was also my first war. Uh, we were fortunate to get the new Hunter, the Mark 56A, with the 230 gallon, which added uh, 160, 200, uh, 260 additional gallons. We could do low level right up to the western border of Pakistan, which hitherto airfields like Peshawar, Kohat, Quetta were all out of reach for the fighters, but not for the hunters. They moved us. We were um, in uh, Hinden. They moved us to Pathan Court, which was just, as you know, 11 nautical miles from the border. So when it became evident that there is going to be conflict, I was called to air headquarters and given a list of targets that we were required. And if I had any objections, I sat and worked out. Quetta I couldn't reach from uh, Pathan Court, low level. But if they were prepared to take a risk, I'd go in high, le uh, high level. But they said, it's not critical. Can you get to Peshawar? I said, yes, we can. So I switched my whole squadron over to operational training. I had 22 pilots, including two on attachment, one on exchange, a naval aviator, and um, reasonably None of them had experience of war either. Uh, so we were all on the same mount. Monday to Friday, we did a lot of flying. One day of the week, I called them into my office, opened up the intelligence on our, each of our targets, and we studied each target very carefully. Well, our role was basically counter air, which really means neutralizing airfields far away so that we tie down their air force guarding that. Therefore, less of the Pakistani air force could affect our army or our air force targets. That is what I was told and explained as to why I was being given this particular role. Uh, it was basically we could only carry guns for this particular distance. Closer targets, we of course, we had rockets and bombs, but the purpose of having this long range would be not be served if we didn't use the tanks and carry the weapon load on the external um, pylons. Um, we had learned another lesson from 65, and that was our aircraft had been caught in the open in 65. So when it became evident that war was evident, the two hunter squadrons, alternately, one of our squadrons would deploy at night or for a day or two back to Ambala or Hinden, sorry, in Agra also in one case, and uh, come back the next day or two days. So on the 3rd of December, all my serviceable aircraft, all my serviceable pilots, all my serviceable engineers 
were not in Pathan court. But I was there with two young pilots and a few of my men when the, the uh, attack took place in the evening. They didn't know the Air One of Western Air Command and I and the station commander and the crew were all in the hangar around an office. They didn't go for the hangar. They, they had a very lucrative strike um, when their preemptive took place. They re it wasn't very effectively done. I could understand why the opening. Uh, uh, they missed the runway, and when they made a few holes here and there, and whistled in and out before our guns could respond. But the balloon had grown up. And we knew that. So, uh, uh, telephones started buzzing. They wanted to know how to get the Air One out of uh, Pathan Court back to uh, various things. Our station commander at that time um, had many attributes. And uh, I was the next senior most on the station. He kept ringing me up what shall we do and what shall we do next or something. And uh, so a good deal of my time was uh, spent on that. And then he called me in at night and he says, your ta uh, targets for tomorrow have arrived. And uh, the first strike they wanted was at Peshawar, at Peshawar's sunrise. Our sunrise was around uh, 5.55, I think, and I think Peshawar was, was around Pakistan time, 5.55, which meant I'd have to do a dark takeoff. Then I asked him, what do I do for aircraft, sir? My aircraft are not here. The command knows it, headquarters knows it, everyone knows it. He said, they said, take two of aircraft from your sister's squadron. I said, I can't walk into us. My squad then demanded, you all tell them to allocate to. So anyway, that was done. And I, the person commanding it had worked under me, YP Mehta. I knew him very well, we were close friends. I said, I want clean aircraft, four tanks, full fuel, full armament. He said, you'll have them. I said, I want them at 4.30 in the morning. He said, this will be done. And I only had a choice between Chani Dillon and Suraj. Chani was more alive. So I called him and I said, would you like to fly wingman with me? Yes, sir. So I said, are you night qualified? He said, no, sir. So I said, fine. You still, you'll do a formation takeoff on me and I will keep my navigation lights on for you. Then we are flying from east to west. It, light, it won't be getting lighter, it'll be getting darker in the beginning. And then uh, when we arrived at, to take over the aircraft, I was alarmed to see the rocket rails protruding beneath the wing. And I said, remove them. He said, it'll take us about 45 minutes to remove the rocket rails. I had to make a very quick decision because I couldn't afford 45 minutes. And I said, I'll be down by about five to 600 pounds of fuel, which is what we had left for combat. So I had no combat fuel. No one could do anything about it. We rolled on time and Chani coped very, very well with me. He stayed with me. We stayed in our side of the territory as long as possible, headed at one time towards Kabul and then came in from the west. When we pulled up at Peshawar, no guns went off. I was rather surprised and looked down. You can't expect targets to be laid out for you. But we did spot an aircraft with a bowser attached to it. I went for that and yelled to um, Chani to fire on whatever he did. Corner of my eye, I caught some fire going. When we came around again, I came in this time from the south. And when I pulled up, I realized that why the guns hadn't gone off was well, because it was being capped by Sabre aircraft who themselves couldn't see us very clearly. So we made a very rapid attack and started receding maximum. There were th 
three or more aircraft we weren't sure behind us. All the way in, do you remember Peshawar around 255 nautical miles uh, from Patan Court. So we had a very long haul back and very, very gradually they were catching up on us. We finally shed tanks, empty tanks, picked up some more speed. And as we neared our border, I decided we split open because I didn't want them all attacking one target. Kept Chani in sight on my left. And as soon as we came somewhere near the Indian border, I told him, you know, you speaking in Hindi because they could follow, they could follow uh, Hindi clearly. I said, I'm going to break you as soon as we reach there. He said, yes, sir. And meantime, they attacked both of us. I broke him into Indian territory. And after that, I had, he was on his own. I was on my own. Um, I turned into a high spot, dark spot, because the hunter was camouflaged. The sabers were not. And did a very tight turn around it. One of the aircraft could not hold the turn and came out in front of me. So very hurriedly, I made a pass. But we had already fired nearly all my ammunition. Later on, he calculated I had down 12 into four rounds left. But the camera caught the aircraft. Um, I don't know whether I hit him or not. So I didn't make a positive claim on the thing. And now we were over Aknur, where the land battle had started. And since we were flying from west to east, the Indians thought we were Pakistanis. And the Pakistanis were sure we were Indians. So we received, I received a lot of ground fire probably from some Indian, enthusiastic Indian gunner, gunners also. Trouble was I was getting desperately low on fuel. And I called up at Court and they said, we've got two gnats capping the airfield. So I was very relieved and I said, uh, I, I'm maintaining height because if I uh, flame out, I'd like to eject on our side of the border and not on their side. Finally, with gauges almost zero, I did lower the undercarriage and came in and they opened the runway and I was happy to know that. I called Chani, he said, sir, a minute, be, a minute from you. So I was very relieved. Both of us landed. My engine flamed out on the taxi track. Chani's flag flamed out on the runway. I don't think any hunter has been flown to that, that extent. Well, that was the first day after I landed, my own aircraft started coming in uh, from various places. I had barely reached my flight office when the SASO of Western Air Command was on the line demanding to speak to me. They had got the information Peshawar already. Uh, how they did it, I don't know. And he instructed me to send your next pair at once. So I said, sir, if you don't mind, I would do it much later in the day. He said, really? I said, yes. I, I'd go in at uh, lunchtime and I'd go in with four to six aircraft. And if you like, I'll lead it again. That's no, no, no. He explained to me from their point of view, they wanted attacks to keep on. So it was almost in order to send an next pair. I sent an next pair and told them, uh, not to get into any combat. They went, the attack went through, but we lost uh, one aircraft and one pilot, a very fine young pilot flying off Samuldi Dharan, and he was paid quite a compliment by the Pakistani pilot uh, who engaged him over Peshawar. Well, that was the first day from after that we went for airfields, we had economic targets, the Atak oil refinery, which I took on myself, and Mangla Dam. And we were prepared in the sense we visited our own Joginder uh, 
refinery at Jugindanagar to know how to attack a refinery. We went to uh, Bhakra to check which was the weakest point of a dam and so on and so forth. So the first five days we were on counter air. On the sixth day onwards, they put us on to close air support to support uh, the army. Uh, things were getting a little hot for them. And uh, I'd like to say for close air support, which we provided in Punjab and JNK all over, uh, it was deeply appreciated by the army. Somewhere in Punch was the first time we were asked to drop 1,000 pounders. And uh, we had, didn't quite know when we went there. There was no opposition, but they were dug into the side of a ravine. Uh, the right person to tell. Let me put it this way. We wanted to make sure uh, make sure that the younger lot got blooded. Chaklala was not too far away. To the best of our knowledge, Chaklala didn't have any operational. So we thought we'd test because Arun was a promising young pilot. In fact, he was no different to the rest of you, apart from the fact that he wore white shoes. Nobody even knew that he was not from the Air Force. Um, they went through on their own and they did very well on, at Chaklara. And um, in answer to your question, I think uh, Arun coped very well. I was happy to have another leader blooded apart from my flight commander and myself. I just had about four or five people I trusted to lead. Chakira was their air advisor, frankly, and one had heard about him and read about him. And I don't think uh, Arun really knew it was Chuck's aircraft, but we were all delighted when he responded. Uh, he thought uh, the Indian Air Force had particularly selected the United States air attaché, personal aircraft to shoot up at Chaklala. Bit of a um, come down for him. He wasn't very pleased about it. Um, but I think Arun had some amusing comments to make on that. Uh, I think in addition, they, they found a multi-engine aircraft at Chaklada also, in addition to Chuck Yeager's. Uh, he seems to have been an interesting person. Our squadron flew one, two, eight sorties, which represents 140 hours and 35 minutes in seven days. You must remember for us, the war was from the 4th to the 11th. On the 11th, after the 11th, the two hunter squadrons were pulled back and another hunter squadron uh, and 30 squadron and 7 squadron came into Patan Court to um, take over and give us a break. I was also 
needed at Western Air Command to be interrogated on a matter which they couldn't speak to me on the telephone. What? So I was. We had what was what the Americans call R and R, rest and relaxation, and uh, Seven Squadron had lost their own commanding officer, who was a prisoner of war. And I think Nirmal Suri was rushed in to take over. So Nirmal came there, and uh, I had to blood him into one sortie. And then our airmen, our technical people, looked after their aircraft. Uh, we were then pulled back into Pathankot two days later, but we were not. The only time we were used there was supposed to be for Chander. And it was called off because two days before the um, peace talks apparently had been taking place, we were unaware of. But I think one of the things that were told to the AOC was no, no uh, um, offensive action after 1600 hours. And at 1600 hours, I had to take nine aircraft back into our dispersal and asked my airmen to take down 18 1,000 pounders, bombs and put back tanks. Those are the perks of being a squadron commander. <laughs> um, we as Indians are not renowned for recording faithfully what has occurred. And I think that's part of the services. Uh, I personally felt that squadron histories are recorded in the diaries if it's written every day or every second day. And that's the only day-to-day -day record of important, unimportant, good, bad, all sorts of things. I was fortunate in having Arun. I didn't know he wrote very uh, well one of his attributes. So. Ray DeMonte also wrote, and uh, I was a bit of a writer myself. So when the war came along, uh, I told Arun that one of his additional secondary duties is to be scribe, and it should be written every evening. And if I may digress, every evening when we had no night flying, I got all my pilots together either in my home or in the mess or someone else's home. And we'd go through the days. Thing. We also needed to escape. And uh, it used to relax people. And, and uh, Arun started writing. And I said, show me what you've written. And I found that he was writing very well. There wasn't anything I can do to improve. But I am very proud of our squadron diary, and there isn't a word there that is not true. First of all, they were a smaller air force in terms of numbers. Secondly, their deployment was such that they couldn't really penetrate too deeply into India. Thirdly, they, I understand they had some hassles about could they really use the saber or the starfighter or whatever? In terms of skill levels, I don't think there should be any difference to our pilots. After all, we are all from the same origin, shall I put it that way. Uh, in 1980, I was attending the Royal College of Defence Studies in uh, London. And my Pakistani colleague was an Air Commodore Alam, highly decorated. Uh, and uh, I was delighted to meet him because I was looking forward to talking, flying. Uh, Alam had many uh, attributes, but he would never talk flying with me. And we discovered that he and I were in Standard 1 in St. James's School, Calcutta in 1941. Not that we remembered each other, but we remembered names Syed Murshid, 
was in that class. He, uh, anyway, um, I wouldn't say they were in any way inferior to us. The problem came about with the platforms we were using, the aircraft that was be using, the skill levels and the knowledge. I don't. I wouldn't uh, say there was much of difference. Luck played a part. The size of the Air Force played a part. The type of targets we had played a part. And uh, I think pilots were about on par with each other. Among my pilots was um, A.K. Sharma, lovable chap, whose nickname was Bama Sharma. Uh, I won't tell you how he earned uh, that. Very embarrassing. But anyway, Bama was a delightful person and ready to go on any mission anywhere. And when this occasion took place, he is probably the only Indian Air Force pilot who's got a mirage on his camera recorded, receding, getting smaller and smaller. When he came back, when we saw this, everybody tapped him on the back and said, Bama Shaba Shari, you're the only one who had how did you let it happen? He said, Yaar, mere kuch hai, to humne us kuch bhi chhodi. This was Baba Sharma, uh, who's still alive very much and very much in touch with us. Jal was my flight commander. We had never met before. My ex-flight commander was Farooq Mehta. So when Farooq was posted out, I was told the squadron leader Jal Mistri will be your flight commander. So I said, ah, one passy to another. And Jal turned up. And we became and very close friends. One of the um, fortunate things in my career was as a CEO, I had a friendship with my two IC. So Jal also was new to Hunters. Uh, but he converted. I found him very trustworthy and uh, very rapidly I knew that he would make a fine squadron commander. And uh, we got along together. Our wives discovered that they were in school together right here in Sikandabad. When we moved to Patan Court, we were on the same net and I kept him um, close to me in the sense uh, we never to fly together at the same time, except on rare occasions. The top secret keys would be just between the two of us. But we did sorties together in practicing for the Peshawar strikes and stray, in uh, practicing for the refinery strikes. We did Patan Court overflying Ambala, overflying Ahmedabad, low level down to Samath range and we fired on targets which I had asked. They had put steel plates yes. behind the target for us to establish how to penetrate. Yes. The idea was just start a fire and let the fire do the work and refine. He was with me on that sortie. He was with me when we all went to Jogindranagar. And um, I had told him that during the war, two of us must not be airborne together. And he was the flight commander, make sure that he was on the ground when I was airborne. And if he was airborne, make sure I was on the ground. So that he flew on the 5th to Kohat, did a successful sortie alone. I took him to task on that. And the next day, I was to lead him and he was to fly with us, so to say. My aircraft failed to start and we had no stand aircraft, standby aircraft. And uh, he decided to take off with uh, Karambaya, I think it was. Anyway, whatever, his number two fell out. And his, I never ever talked to him again, but Jal would have told me, you were on the ground, sir. I was in the air. I followed your instructions. He went into Sakesa and Bala and Arun went into Miawali. 
Sakesar is there, a very central radar station. He attacks Sakesar. And while he attacks Sakesar, I think they pulled the cap of mirages from Meowali to Sakesar. So Arun and Bala, are, uh, they had the airfield at target so there. The last call that we heard was, uh, hey chaps, watch out for me, I'm in the area. And we never heard it again. In the evening we realized that well. Um, Jal's brother who was in the IB had good connections. I think he got through to Pilumeta. Pilumeta had good connections with Bhutto. On that, we came to know that Jal Manikshaw Mistri had been shot down by a mirage. And uh, I said, how would they know his middle name? How would they, how would anyone? And then we discovered his identity card was missing. He was flying with his identity card in his pocket, shouldn't be. And till today, we never knew why and how it happened. But he was played a tribute by Air Commodore Tufail, who used the word intrepid single. And knowing Jal, I have no reason to doubt. I lost a flight commander, I lost a friend. But I created a problem for me because the next in line for a flight commander was Courtney de Bhardwaj, who was on attachment. So I asked him, I said, Ravi, take over the flight. So he called me aside. He said, Sir, sir I'm, I'm on attachment. If you order me, I'll do it. But being on attachment, use one of your own. I could see his point of view, his embarrassment. I miss Jal and our social life together. We were very close friends and still uh, send me. That's what I can tell you about Jal.